tonight. Um, black tern conservation in the Great Lakes. I saw my life for black tern 10 or 12 years ago with Jeff Sanders, who I believe is on the call, at a place that was then called Sour Family Prairie in Kane County. It was also the same day I first saw my first Vesper Sparrow. And I still have a vivid memory of my first ever view of this elegant black and silver water bird flying over the water. Those of you who've had a similar experience will understand why I invited Stephanie Bilkey to talk <laughs> about uh, Black Turn Conservation, the program they're doing in the Great Lakes tonight. Stephanie is the Senior Manager of Conservation Science at Audubon Great Lakes. Um, she saw a diverse migratory flock of warblers in her yard in, in childhood home in Green Bay, and that inspired her to become a birder and conservationist. She joined Audubon in 2017, and she has, you, you might know her best for this, she's led marsh bird monitoring projects to inform coastal wetland restoration across the Great Lakes states, and also engage community scientists in Audubon chapters. In her free time, she can be found birding the rich natural areas of the Chicago region. Stephanie has a BS degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's from the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay. Thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Rena, for having me. <clears throat> and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna get my slides ready. Um, all right, can you see it okay? All right, okay, so um, yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you all about Black Turns. Um, as Rena mentions, there's just something really special about them. And um, I feel like when I saw some for the first time, I just loved them more and more, just getting really up close experiences with them. And I, I just wanted to make a note that you said your next speaker is uh, a naturalist at Horicon Marsh in Wisconsin. And that is actually an excellent place to see a lot of black turns and not, not too far um, from Chicago. So if you're looking to see a lot of black turns and make a, a relatively short trip, I definitely recommend Horicon, but I'm sure Bill can tell you all more, much more about it. Um, all right. So um, I'm just going to, for today's presentation, um, I'm just going to give you an overview about who Audubon Great Lakes are, um, you know, what we do, where we are, um, and then a little intro about black terns themselves. And then um, I'll dig in into our work in the Great Lakes region, conserving the species, um, some of the monitoring that we do, um, some exciting results from a tracking study, and what's next in the future. So just first off, <clears throat> Audubon Great Lakes, we're a regional office of the National Audubon Society. So um, we are part of National Audubon, the, the organization that, you know, puts out the, the big magazine every, um, every quarter. And um, our, our work is conservation, policy, engagement, working with Audubon chapters across um, the five state region of Minnesota, or well, mostly Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan and Ohio, which don't have their own Audubon offices, but we also work with uh, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, New York. So all the, the U.S. Um, Great Lakes states. And um, so uh, mostly we focus on uh, wetland, coastal wetland restoration and monitoring. That's a big part of our work for our conservation team. And I'm just showing you some of the highlighted areas where we work. We call these our priority regions. And so circled, um, you know, here in Chicago area, the Calumet is a really important region, but I'm also going to be talking a lot about Michigan today where we do a lot of work. And as you can see very clearly on this map, uh, Michigan has a really um, big coast along the Great Lakes. So that's, you know, why we spend a lot of time there. Um, but outlined in red is basically, and the, the varying shades there are just showing what are really important wetland areas. And that was determined from using a lot of bird data to tell us, you know, where, where the birds are. And that helps us determine where we should be um, focusing our work. So um, 
Uh, just jumping right in, black turns. I want to do um, a little bit of introduction of you know what they are and what we're dealing with. Um, black terns are a small species of tern that breeds in um, uh, uh, freshwater wetlands, uh, mostly marshes. They're an aerial forager. <laughs> so that means that um, they spend a lot of time flying and then they kind of skim the, the surface of the water and pick off um, small fish and um, insects. That's what they mostly eat. And um, they mostly build their nests in um, on floating mats. Uh, the picture here shows some dead uh, cattails mostly that are kind of clumped together and they just build their nests right on top of that mat. And then they also will um, nest in lily, uh, water lily uh, mats as well. So this is a picture on the left showing one of the sites that I'm going to be talking a lot about today. It's also my background, um, but that's Wigwam Bay on Saginaw Bay in um, lower Michigan. And I, I do just want to relay my own personal story with black terns, and that is when I was a master's student at University of Wisconsin Green Bay, I signed on to a project that my um, professor, my advisor was leading where we were going out and collecting a lot of data on breeding marsh birds all across the Great Lakes in different areas. And one of the first days that they sent me out to survey, <clears throat> I had to uh, leave Green Bay, where I was living, um, at 2 a.m. We drove up to the upper <laughs> Michigan to be out there at dawn in a canoe, and I was I was prepared. I knew knew what species we were expecting. I knew that black tern was on the list, but I didn't really know. You know, I didn't I didn't know the site we were going to. It was my first time, and um, I was really just kind of like new to the area because. Um, I'd been living in uh, Madison for the last seven years. So it was just, everything was new to me. We get out, the sun is coming up. It's still dark. Um, I'm about to start my survey. And then all of a sudden we're in the middle of a black turn colony. <laughs> it was it was just incredible like to have that moment where it's so quiet, the sun is rising. And then you hear these little squeaks above your head and then stumbling across um, these nests that are in this little like muddy mounds of uh, dead vegetation. And it was just just a really incredible experience. I was preparing to hear these and see these birds, but I, I just didn't didn't know that it would be that day. So um, uh, I'm gonna show you a video so you can have, hopefully if this works, your own experience of what it is like to be out in a nesting site among all of these um, birds, fly, uh, black terns flying overhead. So this is about a two minute video. So see how it's I am Caleb Putnam, Michigan Bird Conservation Coordinator for Audubon Great Lakes and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. St. Clair Flats is a magical place. It makes up the world's largest freshwater delta where Lake Huron pours her sparkling blue waters through towards Lake Erie. The area is a major shipping channel for freighters shipping iron ore between Duluth and Lake Ontario. We're here because a special bird needs our help. Black terns are an amazing animal. Elegant, graceful flyers with jet black plumage. Since the 1960s, we've lost approximately 70 to 80% of all our terns, and we don't know why. St. Clair Flats hosts Michigan's largest remaining colony of black terns, over 150 pairs most years. The extensive marshes of the area provide ample places to nest. Black terns spend up to eight months at sea each year, mainly in the tropical oceans bordering the equator. But each summer, adult terns return to Michigan to nest during May, June, and July. Black terns place their eggs precariously on mats of floating dead vegetation. They lay three eggs literally inches from the water's surface. Although this seems dangerous, the strategy is actually ingenious. Mammals have a hard time swimming out to the nest colonies, and when they do, the adults team up to attack them and drive them away. The adults here produce a lot of eggs and chicks each summer, but we don't know how many of these birds survive the winter and return to nest again. 
We're using the tools of science to figure out how we can help them rebound to their previous numbers, restoring the Great Lakes coastal wetlands while we're at it. We want to make sure this important species is here for our grandchildren and their grandchildren. By capturing and banning both chicks and adults, we let the birds tell us how they're in trouble. And once we know why the population isn't able to sustain itself, we'll be able to help bring them back for future Michiganders of all generations to enjoy. I am Caleb. I am Caleb. Pop. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right. So that's just uh, uh, to get you acquainted with what it might be like to be out in the middle of uh, a colony. You can see I, I've, I've been out to that site and gotten to, to wade through there and um, check out those nests. It's been a pretty awesome experience. But um, I just wanted to show you the black terns range. And interestingly, this is an international species. They're, they can be found in North and South America, as well as Africa, Europe, and Asia. So um, the orange is showing their breeding grounds. So we are really at the southern edge of their breeding grounds um, in northern Illinois. And then the blue, which is a little bit hard to see, is their wintering grounds. And it's really just that thin line along the coast. They spend a lot of time over the ocean um, and on the 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 coast, the inner, uh, marine coast. So um, along Mexico, Central and South America, our our breeding black terns go. Um, you know, of course, to Central and South America, the 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 breeding population in Europe and Asia is totally separate, and they um, migrate to Africa. But if you if you take a trip um, in, around, uh, you know, January, February, you have a chance of seeing um, some black turns if you're if you're going um, into any of the blue areas. But pretty neat that, you know, they only really use uh, freshwater wetlands in the spring and then um, using a completely different habitat in the winter. And unfortunately, as it, hinted at in the the video and you know why we're talking about black turns day is that they are um, not doing very well in our region so they're state endangered in illinois wisconsin indiana own ohio and they're about to be listed um to endangered in michigan right now they're listed as special concern and um the graph just shows um um, that's from data collected at the St. Clair Flats colony, where they were showing the video with Caleb that was talking um, that population has declined pretty dramatically over the last 10 years. So um, in order to determine, you know, what is happening with black turns and why they're in trouble and what we can do to help, um, one of the groups that Audubon Great Lakes formed is called the Great Lakes Black Turn Conservation Initiative. And this is a group of partners from all over the place. We keep adding people every year. And so we've got partners in, um, <clears throat> in Michigan and in Indiana or Illinois, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Canada as well. We have partners across the international border. And every year we get together and share the latest research and we, we get together so we can communicate about um, uh, different resources that we have for monitoring and helping these species, things like putting out um, nesting platforms, nesting cameras to best understand what's happening at these nesting sites. And then, um, you know, also to brainstorm future priorities for, for conservation that we can work on together as a group. Um, so shared goals that we have for this initiative are, of course, to reverse declines or at least stabilize populations. And then um, uh, as part of that, determine um, what kind of habitat they need to survive and succeed, um, because there's a lot we really don't know um, why they're declining and what the, the best um, way is to help them. So, of course, 
we're, we're considering habitat because a lot of birds in general are suffering from habitat loss and we know wetlands are in trouble and need help um, because we have lost a lot of wetlands in our region over the last, um, uh, well, basically last 200 years. And um, with that, we've also seen dramatic declines in habitat quality with the rise of invasive species. Um, so the group also is used to share monitoring strategies. We're really interested in being able to have the same kind of monitoring protocols uh, across the region so then we can better compare our data. And um, just the ones that I have in bold here are ones that I'm going to be talking about more tonight about how specifically our team at Audubon um, has focused on habitat management strategies and needs at colonies. Um, and then a special project that I'm going to be talking about the results of are how we've um, been tracking um, individual black terns and using that to better identify their migratory pathways. And um, this uh, migration tracking data is helpful in contributing to what's called a full annual cycle life cycle model. And basically what that means is that we crunch a lot of data and determine um, what's going on throughout the, the life period of uh, black terns from breeding to migration to wintering and try to use that information to identify like where the highest threats are to the species. So um, I'll get into next. Um, monitoring and habitat management work um, that our office has been leading over the last um, 10 years or so with black terns. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is um, this uh, study that we're working on in Michigan, and most of this work is, is, is going to be in Michigan because we have a lot of uh, black terns there, and it's um, uh, just where the work got started, and there's um, uh, it's it's easy to study them in some of the areas that we've been working in. So, um, in 2021, we proposed a project where in Michigan they hadn't done a breeding bird atlas in at least um, I think it had been at least 15 years, and um, there were a lot of questions about whether the colony sites that were identified in the breeding bird atlas were still active or not. So this is a map showing um, where all the, the known colonies were. And the um, it's either red, inactive, purple, unknown, or green active that was known at the time. And as you can see, there's very not very much green on this map, unfortunately. And um, so our goal was to set out and recruit volunteers, send them out to some of these places, and um, get data back to tell us whether or not these sites are active. And that'll just give us a better picture of what the um, status of black terns in Michigan is. And um, Wigwam Bay and St. Clair Flats are starred here. Those are some pretty big colonies, um, also on sites that um, the D Michigan DNR manages. So um, we know that we can really work with the DNR to influence management there. So that's where we've been working um, pretty heavily in the last um, five to 10 years. And the picture just shows uh, my colleague, Jenny, uh, the, which has caught a rare moment with a black turn landing on her head. What was happening here is that we do a lot of banding of individuals and they were, uh, Aaron and um, my colleagues, Aaron and Jenny were banding a chick and these adults were very protective of that chick and swooping in um, just as birds do when they're protecting their chicks, they were kind of dive bombing them. So it just was a really lucky moment that they caught this. I don't think it, you know, stayed on her head for very long. So that's at um, Wigwam Bay. So um, uh, there's, I don't have the results yet of that project. That's just an introduction of what's going on. But I think, you know, they're still finding that a lot of the, the sites that were inactive or unknown are still, that is the case, either inactive. I think we found a few other colonies that we can light up green on that map, but it's, it's not looking very good for black terns, unfortunately, in Michigan. Um, but that is, you know, helping at least 
identify them as endangered species, and that'll help bring in more um, focus on the species and state. So that's a good thing. Um, uh, next, I'm just going to mention the St. Clair Flats um, State Wildlife Area. Um, so that was one of the starred areas on the map. This is where we've had the longest um, ongoing research, and that was where the data was pulled, where it showed that you know sharp downturn trend. <clears throat> So this is, uh, again, this is a Michigan um, DNR managed site that's um, part of a, a complex of islands in Lake St. Clair, which kind of connects Lake Huron to um, Lake Erie. Um, so just uh, north east of the Detroit area. So um, to get there, you have to take a ferry and then you have to drive out to a boat dock and then launch a boat. Um, into this kind of uh, embayment estuary area where it's you get all these um, kind of islands forming it's like small islands and clumps of vegetation and it is an area that black terns love but also it is really popular uh, recreational area too so you get a lot of fisher uh, fishing going on you get a lot of boating activity so that can also be a potential threat to some of these birds as well, because where there's a lot of people, they don't necessarily see those nests that are floating in the water. So um, something that you know needs to be worked on is to get more of the word out to boaters to be um, careful around these areas where these really special endangered species are nesting. So over the period since 2012, we have teams going out every year, uh, mostly led by Detroit Audubon. Um, which is a, one of our chapters, and um, volunteers go out and monitor how these uh, colonies are doing, get overall numbers, and they've also have a long-term banding project. So they're banding chicks, they're banding adults, and then um, by banding them and going out every year, we can get better information about how long these birds are living and if they return to the nest the same year after year. And that's um, me in a kayak, one of the years where the water was really high, um, in the, the video that I showed you earlier, you saw people walking out in the water and it was, you know, maybe at knee, knee height or, or a little bit around hip level. This was not the case. I think that was maybe in 2019 or so, or um, maybe it's 2020. Um, well, water, water levels fluctuate a lot. And that's something, you know, that these birds have to, to figure out. Um, because uh, it really affects the, the habitat in this um, area where there's a lot of interface between the water and vegetation. Um, I just wanted to make a note because um, the nest cameras were mentioned. So we do put out a series of nest cameras. So that's basically a, a, a camera that's um, like a wildlife camera trap. Um, it's set up to record um, either, it, it'll be like a, a, a shot every several seconds or however long that they set it for. And then um, they go back after the nest is finished and then they go back and see, you know, if there were any predators or what other kind of threats these birds might've been facing during that really vulnerable stage. Um, so this is just a picture about how, um, showing how we capture the, the black terns. So this is an adult um, on a nest on the left. Uh, our team puts these, uh, uh, handmade uh, wire mesh cages over the nest while the adults are incubating. And um, as to not disrupt the eggs, they actually put like what they call dummy eggs on the nest. So if there's like, um, you know, any movement in the nest that could knock the, the eggs out there, they're actually kept safe on the boat while they're doing this. But um, basically they put the cage over the nest and then we head out in the boat, you know, uh, several yards away and then they watch it the whole time so it's not like left for very long um, and then eventually the adult at first is a little suspicious and then it'll eventually land on the top where you see um i think I, i'm not sure if that's aaron's arm reaching in um they'll 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 kind of perch on top and then they'll dive down and but they won't be able to get out because they have to spread out their wings in order to fly out and um, so then we grab the adult um, sometimes they leave it on to get the other adult because both male and females uh, incubate. And then, um, you know, as soon as we get one or if we're not getting the other or we get both, then we we leave them alone. But that's um, how they, they put the bands on the adults. And the chicks are um, also banded, but that's 
um, when, when they're about like three days old, um, we can just kind of take them off the nest since they're not um, going anywhere. Um, a little bit about um, ongoing work at St. Clair Flats. You can see these areas that are highlighted in different colors. Um, I, I don't know if you, if you can, yeah, if you can see my mouse, my cursor here. Uh, so this is kind of the area where we see a lot of nests in this more open uh, area. And these are areas that are um, diked wetlands, but they're mostly filled in with a lot of cattail. Um, so the, the idea was that, you know, it's, it's hard to manage water levels in this open system out here in the bay, but in the diked areas, they have um, more control over raising and lower water levels. And um, so the idea is to try to attract them to some of these areas, but that since they're so full of cattail, it's really not a preferred nesting habitat for black terns. So currently, um, they're trying to in, improve the habitat within um, these diked regions by um, mowing uh, cattail and phragmites and trying to open it up and attract more black terns. So that's that's ongoing. There are issues <laughs> with getting equipment and everything in there. So it's taken a little bit longer than we'd like, but since there's a lot of dedication to the area and volunteers, we're you know hoping to use that in order to monitor before and after, um, not just for black terns, but other um, breeding marsh birds and waterfalls as well, waterfall as well. Um, Wigwam Bay, um, which I mentioned, that's the site in my background, and it's um, on the uh, northern uh, uh, part of a uh, Lake uh, Saginaw Bay. Uh, it's it's mostly it's got these lily uh, water lilies, and that's uh, they actually nest on the root masses of the the lilies. So it's it's kind of an interesting different uh, approach than they do at St. Clair Flats, where they're really mostly using cattail and bulrush. But um, we've had ongoing work there um, since 2018, where we've also just been monitoring the populations banding chicks, banding adults, and um, also placing cameras to see what kind of threats um, turns are experiencing here. And um, one really important difference also between Wigwam Bay and St. Clair Flats is that Wigwam Bay is a completely uh, an impounded or diked wetland. So they do have some ability potentially to control water, but it's, it's also just a very like different system than um, St. Clair Flats. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> with those cameras that we put out, we did detect some predator activity. And at Wigwam Bay, the the, the most um, voracious predator of nests that we have are raccoons. And so having this information is really helpful to see if you know we can develop strategies in the future to deter predators. And I think you know the reason why we see um, you know, larger mammal predators at um, Wigwam Bay and not necessarily at St. Clair Flats is that they can walk out onto the impoundment. It's a road and it's, you know, easily uh, made easy to access by people, but also mammals. So they can walk out on the road and then they can kind of swim over and see all these nests. Even, you know, they have a good viewpoint from, from the road. So one of these raccoons can take out, you know, several dozen nests in one night, unfortunately. So it's, it's pretty, pretty um, startling and, you know, sad to see, especially because these are species that are really not doing very well, but we really have to take a multi um, strategy approach in order to, you know, make sure that these birds continue to survive and do well. But unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we're, we're going to see these, these predator incidents, but we, we're trying to learn from them. Um, so this is kind of a nice aerial shot of what Wigwam Bay looks like. You can see that kind of river going through that that's used um, by boats mostly. Um, but you, you see these kind of like open water patches and that is what, you know, the black terns are looking for is that really more even mix of open water and vegetation because as I said, they're aerial foragers. So they're spending a lot of time flying over water and then, um, you know, looking for food, they wouldn't be able to see their food if there was, they were just flying over uh, this maze of, of just, just cattail. They really want to see that open water area, but then they also want a lot of vegetation so that they can hide their nests. Um, but so we're looking for that even mix. 
Uh, Wigwam Bay has a lot of cattail. It tends to be of the more invasive variety and it grows in um, like a monoculture, which you know makes it look like a cornfield, but just of, of cattail. So mm -hmm. there's um, a lot of cattail and it. We, we want less of it. We want more areas of open water, but we don't want to we can't necessarily even have the resources to get rid of it all. Um, and we don't want to because we want a mix of vegetation and water. And a lot of um, breeding uh, wetland birds do depend on, you know, taller vegetation patches as well. So um, there was an effort in 2018 that Audubon Great Lakes led in partnership with the Michigan DNR to um, cut kind of, or they, they did an herbicide treatment of patches of cattail. And, and note this was done in the fall after, um, you know, most of the, the birds have, have left. But um, they, they did a treatment and then afterwards we came back to monitor, you know, if, uh, if the birds were affected by the treatment. But unfortunately, we weren't able to um, knock down the dead cattail. So there still isn't a lot of open water because we found out that it is a very difficult system to, to get it into and like bring in equipment that would be able to chop down the cattail. So it's it's definitely a work in progress. We're, we're still learning more about, you know, the best ways to, to manage for, for these birds. And we also expect that, you know, if we do the management, um, eventually some of that cattail will get knocked down. And then we can, you know, as long as we're visiting every year, we can see what the impact of that management was. And there's more uh, treatment follow-up um, happening in the next year. Um, so next I'm going to be talking about a radio tracking study and our results so far to develop um, an integrated population model, which um, is, a, is a jargony term, but basically it's, um, you know, what I was referring to before about um, plugging in a lot of numbers and then using that to determine where in the lifespan of a black churn, the life cycle, um, you know, are the highest threats to that species. You know, um, especially those that um, breed in our area. So um, this study started in 2019 and it wrapped up um, this past year. And um, several of my team members, Aaron Ford, Sarah Saunders, uh, worked on this project with me. Um, we also worked closely um, with Dave Moore with Environment Canada, Alex John with Indiana University. And this was um, done thanks to uh, funding from the Upper Mississippi River and Great Lakes Joint Venture. Um, so our questions, we have several years of data on monitoring these black turns, um, especially at these locations, St. Clair Flats and Wigwam Bay. And um, what um, our folks out in the field notice is that they had a really hard time. They, they could monitor the nest. They could have the cameras on it. They said, oh, the nest seemed to be successful, but where are the young birds? We're having a hard time. Um, knowing if the birds actually successfully fledged the nest. And the question was, is we already know that um, that nesting period is such a vulnerable time for not just for black, bird, black terns, but you know, all birds. Um, is there something that's preventing um, black terns from successfully fledging young? Um, and then along with that, you know, getting into that question I mentioned before, what is the most vulnerable time period in their lifespan? So those are two big questions that we are trying to ask um, folded into this tracking study, which also um, made use of a lot of the data that we had collected um, just from monitoring over the last 10 years. And then our study areas, again, are the same um, sites that I've been talking about, um, St. Clair Flats, Michigan, and Wigwam Bay. So our um, this is a picture of a a MODIS tower. So I'm going to be talking about um, a radio tracking technology that's called MODIS. And I, I could probably do a whole presentation just on what MODIS is, but I'll try to be brief in that um, it uses um, technology where um, uh, a radio uh, tracking device is put on a bird. And then when it's in proximity to one of these towers as shown, then it picks up that signal and then, you know, it communicates back to us that the bird was in um, proximity to those towers. And we can put the towers anywhere. So as the birds move, they can be picked up by multiple towers. But our, our goal was to get 60 nano tags out on black turn chicks 
during that pre-fledging period so that we can understand, you know, if we can actually get real data that says they left the nest, they were picked up by the tower somewhere else. That means it was successful. And we really can, you know, track it back to where that bird came from and, um, uh, you know, where, where they nested or where the nest was. Um, we also, in order to do this project, we had to establish more modus towers um, around Lake St. Clair. And then we also had to put up a tower at Wigwam Bay because it happened uh, later that we needed to add, add a second site because our other, we had, it was a, it was kind of a backup to another site where actually none of the black turns were successful. Um, and then uh, synthesize a whole lot of data. So <laughs> population data, nest monitoring data, mark recapture, which means the data that comes in when we put a band on a bird and then we, we get it back another year. That's helping us determine how long these birds live. And that all goes into that model. And then um, the, the result is to find out, you know, how, how, what the population viability is. is. Is this a population that can survive, you know, decades into the future? Or are we really going to, you know, hear, see a really steep drop off and that they, they can't bounce back from? Oh, oops, I went the wrong way. All right. So these are those nano tags that I'm talking about. So they're really tiny. Um, and then, um, the antenna is the long, you know, strand on the wire on the back. And then the little um, tiny um, plastic piece is what gets strapped to the back of the bird. And um, so I'll, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like on a bird, but it's it's a little bit hard to see. But basically it gets gets placed right on lying, lying flat on the back of the bird, that, that tag. And then you're seeing the antenna kind of coming out with the tail and it has a, a little elastic um, band uh, wrapped around its chest. So it kind of fits like a backpack and it's actually uh, made so that the, the, the wire that fits around the back as the backpack will degrade over time and it's meant to drop off. Um, so these nano tags only really, since they have uh, depend on a battery that's not like gonna be continuously powered it'll only last about three months or so, but that'll still give us really good data about these birds leaving the nest. And these are um, the pre-fledged chicks that were um, receiving their tags. And this is about 10 days old. So um, right after they receive these tags is um, kind of very shortly afterwards, you can see that they're already growing in their flight feathers that these birds are gonna be ready to, to take off. And um, this is a map of the sites and the towers that were placed up over the, um, just uh, those uh, little red stars. But um, this map also shows all the little yellow like butterfly shapes are different modus towers. So you can see if we would expect some of these birds to fly south since it's fall when we're deploying them. And then they have some towers ready to catch th their signals on, on the other side of Lake Erie as they're moving that way. So we didn't reach our goal of 60 tags. It was really hard. We had a few really tough seasons. We had to deal with COVID and figure out a field season in there. Um, but um, we, uh, yeah, we deployed 48 tags um, at our two sites, St. Clair Flats and Wigwam Bay. And then we launched several new towers, um, Wigwam Bay, um, and then three that were around Lake St. Clair. And this is a fully fledged churn with uh, its nano tag still on. So that's a pretty amazing shot. And you can see also its bands. Um, and then um, just an overview of the results from uh, the 2021 deployment, since it was the most successful um, results. We had um, 20 of uh, 28 tags that were detected by towers. And then 13 of those 20 tags were detected at multiple receivers. So that means that, you know, they were detected um, not just, you know, at home base, but further abroad too. And then um, 12 tags with multi-receiver detections um, indicated fledging. So that 12 of those birds definitely fledged. And I know you're probably thinking 12 out of 48, that's 
doesn't seem super great, but in the world of um, birds, it's it's this is the most vulnerable period of their lives, and at least half of you know birds don't don't make it if if not more than that in general. That's that's a really scary statistic, but that's that's how you know how birds have survived all this time. So um, actually, our even and even though it may seem low, it was higher than we thought. Um, so uh with just counting birds and looking at the sky and be like okay i see like five birds that looks like they recently fledged and whatnot but it, it was actually higher than what we had been able to do with just with just counting birds and then um yeah i'll get into a little bit more of the maps and everything but nine of those 12 seem to use the atlantic coast after they fledged um so this a uh, chart is a little bit difficult to look at, but basically what we're looking at is e on the left-hand side, all those numbers are different. Those are the identification codes for their tags. And then this is a timeline from August to October, that three month period from when they were banned or they were not banded, but um, tagged uh, to uh, later in the, the, the whole fall season showing how many when those were detections occurred. And then this is showing, this is basically a map without a map. It's on a graph. So it's showing like Wigwam Bay, St. Clair Flats, and then each color is a different bird and showing kind of their journey over time. And um, then latitude is the, the y-axis. So you can, as you can see, they're all going south, but uh, you can also notice that they're, they're, um, they're uh, yeah, I think, well, I'll show you a map that'll make it easier to see what where where they're going. Um, a, another really cool thing that we were able to do because there were multiple towers at a uh, modus towers at the St. Clair flat site is to be able to measure activity rates. So these dots for each graph, this is a single individual and the x axis horizontal axis is um, time. And then the orange line is showing sunrise and blue is sunset. And basically what this is showing is that there's a lot of activity concentrated during sunset and that increases over time during over the days. And that's um, what we call, you know, migratory restlessness. You might have heard that term before. So these are birds that are staying in one place, but it's picking up a lot more movement closer to sunset as the days progress. And that means that those birds are getting ready to migrate. They're just got so much energy and activity in them. They're, they're getting ready to fly the longest flight that they've ever flown in their lives, which is pretty incredible to think about with these tiny birds. And um, this is another chart just showing um, three different tags, tag birds, and then um, on the axis, um, on the vertical axis is showing the different sites that they were picked up on over time. So in the beginning, they're all being picked up at either Lake St. Clair, Wigwam Bay, and then they start being picked up by other towers. Um, we've got several um, several that were picked up, you know, in Ohio, and then they started to um, be picked up even further south. Um, this is another way of looking at the information. There's just so many ways of visualizing the data, but each plot is a single bird and each kind of um you kind of see these little little mountain peaks and that's like the the signal strength from each tower and the different colors are different towers so you can see in like this first graph there's two towers really close to each other so it's like oh it's getting close to this one now it's getting a little bit closer to this other tower and over here you can see um, this bird, uh, you know, flew by this tower and went way past, and then it was picked up again by the same tower. And it's showing, you know, over time that it's it's moving and getting picked up by these different towers. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this is all during each of these is one day. So this bird was picked up by five different towers in Maryland, all on this one day, August thirty first. Um, this, this is basically kind of the same thing, but, um, 
showing just a little bit up close view for, for different birds that were picked up um, by two towers um, at one site and at another site at the same time. So these are these are my favorite maps showing the routes that these birds are taking. And if you go to the website, which is uh, modus.org, I can drop that in the chat as well, um, that you can actually look up these maps them yourself because this is publicly available data. But you can type in like explore tags and type in block charts and you can find our project and explore the routes of all of these birds. But um, this is this is really cool to see is that um, a lot of these birds, before they go south, they basically head straight east, which is really um, something, you know, we learned about these birds in Michigan, but it also makes a lot of sense. That's basically the fastest pathway to get to the ocean coast, which is where they want to be anyway. So instead of flying over, think about flying directly south from Michigan, you're going to be flying over a lot of farmland, forest. It's not going to be a lot of wetlands. So they, they want to head straight east and then south. So you know, we didn't really know that before um, we put out these tags. Um, it does show that, you know, we're missing a lot of data. The, I guess this map shows it really well where these little circles are, are the towers. And there's really no detections in this area over the Appalachians because there's just fewer receivers there. So that's one thing where there's a straight line. It doesn't mean that the bird necessarily took a straight path, but we just don't have any data. So that's just the shortest distance that we can, you know, project. Um, so of all the information that we learned from this study, um, uh, this is just a summary and a recap of our results, where that Ohio and Pennsylvania Tower is really important for uh, detecting uh, black terns during migration. And then um, they arrived around the Atlantic coast sometime between mid-August to mid-September. Um, Knowing that can really drive management specifically during that migratory phase if we're really just focused on, you know, fall migration. Um, and then uh, national wildlife refuges ended up being really important. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily because, well, I mean, it could be for a variety of reasons that they have towers, but of course, national wildlife refuges are going to be well managed. Um, they're going to provide a lot of habitat. So it was really cool to see um, time and time again. Um, you can see like this Cape Romaine um, National Wildlife Refuge in South Carolina. Six of our tagged individuals were all picked up at the same tower. So that's that's pretty incredible because it you can tell not all these birds were following the same path by any means. They were all going to different places, but really need to see that they're all keying in on some of the same spots. Um, so... Um, other things, oh yeah, the 43% of fledging rate, again, like I said, is higher than we thought. The observed fledging rate in that same year was only 25%. And that's, we we saw seven of the birds that were tagged out of 28. And the, the modus detections tell us that rate is much higher. So um, what we thought, oh, this is a fun graph that just shows the kind of in real time or not in real time, but like basically when these detections were happening. Um, so we, we thought that a lot of these birds moved through the Gulf Coast um, originally just because it was an area that eBird modeling showed was super important for black terns. Doesn't mean it's not important. I'm sure it is really important for a lot of uh, breeding black terns that are further west, and that is, you know, more of the shortest distance that they can take. But we found out, you know, that the Atlantic coast was super important, especially for Michigan birds, and then that can help us, you know, make sure that those areas are conserved into the future. Um, we're also learning um, that. Um, uh, this this will come out later in the the publication that's being worked on, but that adult survival is really critical to population viability. Um, so it's it's not necessarily the survival of the young birds that is the critical factor. So that's part of that integrated population model or IPM that I that I mentioned before. So um, in a uh, a uh, short just mention that uh, 
all this data has been synthesized into a bigger publication that's about to come out soon. Um, it's led by Kayla Davis, who's a PhD student at Michigan State University that we worked closely with. And so it's called Breeding Season Management is Unlikely to Improve Population Viability of a Data Deficient Migratory Species in Decline. So um, if you want to learn more about that study, I don't want to like reveal too much more before, you know, it's published. So I'll, I'll definitely, um, you know, let you know when that's out and then you can read more about um, what Kayla found from all this all these different kinds of data grouped together. Um, so quickly, what's next? Please um, remember to check out our publication. Um, our Great Lakes uh, Black Turn Conservation Initiative is gonna continue to meet on an annual basis. We're also exploring new partnerships with Audubon South Carolina. So they're, you know, they're fellow Audubon um, employees and they can kind of help us make that connection to see if there's more uh, movement between our Michigan colonies and South Carolina. Um, and then um, we're continuing those uh, efforts to manage habitat in Michigan, even though, you know, there are some results that suggest that the breeding um, uh, and uh, the breeding season isn't necessarily um, what's driving uh, declines. But we still, you know, have ways of improving habitat where we are. So I think that's still really important to do. And also, it's a really also great way to, you know, raise awareness about these really special birds to at our where we live. Um, or closer to home, at least. So, um, but even closer to home in Illinois, I just wanted to highlight for you all, um, since there's a lot of uh, folks joining us from the Chicago region, and uh, where you can find black terns near you. I did mention Horicon earlier in Wisconsin. I definitely still recommend that. But in Illinois, our largest uh, breeding population is around the Chain of Lake State Park area. But all these dots on the map are um, where black terns have been detected or observed uh, according to eBird. So you can still see black terns, especially during migration. That'll be coming up, you know, late April, early May, um, turns will be moving through our area. A lot of them go further north. So if you check out your local wetland, you have the possibility of seeing black turns stopping over. And uh, I just also want to like to point out these little blue flags over Lake Michigan. I love to see that that people have spotted them over the open lake. Of course, not surprising. These birds spend a lot of time over ocean. They're not afraid of um, flying over Great Lakes. So if you if you own a boat and you want to go across Lake Michigan in the spring or fall, you have a chance maybe of seeing a black turn. Um, what you can do to help, uh, last but not least, of course, look for our upcoming publication. And um, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but we we love it when people report sightings to eBird whenever you see a black turn. But also, if you note any nesting behaviors, there's ways of capturing that data in eBird um, that you saw a nest, that you saw chicks, that you saw carrying nesting material or carrying food. That's really important data that'll help us, um, uh, the folks that are doing the science and the work, really uh, know you know where breeding locations may be that we didn't know about. Uh, of course, if you are a recreational boater or you know somebody who has a motorboat in some of these areas, um, let them know that it's really important to stay clear of any kind of floating vegetation and, you know, give them space, um, slow your wake. And then um, lastly, we just encourage you to advocate for Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding. That's a federal program through the Environmental Protection Agency that um, funds a lot of work in our coastal wetlands across the Great Lakes region, and it's really helping us um, continue these efforts to manage um, and understand the species better. So that's my presentation. So um, thank you so much, and I am here to take any questions. Thank you, Stephanie. I just unmuted me. Sunny will return everyone. Here we go. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, that last photo in particular showed the beauty and elegance of that, the species, it's so beautiful. Um, okay, I do have a few questions in the chat, if I can get to them. I think you ha may have answered some of them. Um, okay, let's see. Bob Stanley says, 
this wouldn't surprise me, although that place I think is pretty much dead for birds right now. Um, I believe there used to be in the 80s and 90s, black turns a dead stick pond in, in the Calumet area. Do you know if they're still seen there? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> unfortunately, um, not that I am aware of. Um, so Audubon Great Lakes also leads breeding marsh bird surveys every um, spring and black turn is one of our focal species. And as far as far as uh, as long as I've been running the survey since um, 2017, there's never been a black turn detected in any of the Calumet, Illinois wetlands. Um, so that's kind of like South Chicago area, dead stick. Um, like Calumet area, but um, we did have a single um, black turn that was, or two black turns that were detected at a wetland in Indiana, um, LaSalle um, National, or uh, State Wildlife Area, LaSalle, um, and they were only seen once so in May, so it was likely that they were migrating through um, and I also found a black turn at one of the Gary wetlands, and that was just a, another migrant. Um, so in all that time, we have never had any breeding black turns in Calumet, um, though that's really interesting to hear that they might have nested at dead stick that yeah there there's not a whole lot of uh, birds breeding at dead stick ponds, though we have. Um, yeah, we we have been doing monitoring there. So and we're also doing some more restoration work there. So it'll be just a, definitely follow along to see if we have any improvements. Yeah, a dead stick pond, um, I think is, well, years ago, we saw our first marble godwit there, but it seems like it's filled in so much that there's not much happening there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with some of the low water years that we've had, it's dried out completely. So oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Occasionally we get um like a Virginia rail or something like that, but it's, it's uh and we have had pied bill grebes that I don't know if they have nested there recently. I don't think they have. My question, uh, since all of your charts indicated that you could tell which bird and which tag was passing by the modus tower. So the modus tower not only knows it's a bird and it's a tag, but it can identify it by the number. Yes. So what happens is that, and I'm I'm not necessarily an expert on modus technology, so I'll explain it the best I can. But um, each tag has an, a unique signal, so it's built into the system that like you have to program the signal into the tag, and then. Um, the, the computers and everything like have all of that mapped out. So then it kind of like is able to uh, upload the information into the MODIS website and they, they connect the dots of like the signal equals this tag and so on. Okay. Yeah, I wondered about that. And then when I saw your charts, I realized that it could identify the bird. Um, let's see, um, Lynn says, uh, what's the receptive range of a MODIS tower? Yeah, I, I had to double check this, but it's about a nine mile radius. Uh, how much? Not nine miles. Nine miles. Okay. Um, Alan said he missed the first 10 minutes. What's the desired habitat? I think you kind of showed, um, we know the habitat, but you, I think he meant the location. So Chain of Lakes does have, um, sometimes you can't see them, but uh, if you're at this one spot near the canoe launch, um, Sometimes there's there's a lot of uh, black turns there, but more like I think in June. Um, okay, my question, I know you don't want to give away the, <laughs> the study, but why are adults so critical to viability? Can you give us a view from- Yeah, how yeah, it's so interesting, right? Because it's like, we focus so much on like the breeding season. We're like, so many chicks, we got to get all the chicks, but it's like, these birds are really long lived. So, um, you know, having the adults come back year to year, that is like the core of the population. So it's like, if you're having some kind of mortality or a die off of adults, the population is going to shrink massively because they can replenish themselves, you know, quickly, like some, some animals can, they're, they're more long lived and a, there's a, there's just a high mortality rate of chicks to begin with. So it's like, if if there's you know half the population of adults is lost, you're you're gonna have a huge decline in birds because they can only produce so many young and there's so many 
on, only so many of those young that make it into adulthood. That would seem like that would be true of all birds, all species then. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, but you, you do see a lot of like certain species, you know, will like mice, for example, not a bird, but like, you know, a mouse could like, just like replace itself multiple to multiple times in yeah. a year, you know? I meant so birds. it's like, yeah, different strategies. Okay. Um, can you put your um, email in the chat? Oh yeah. People are asking, they might have other questions, follow up. Okay, I'll take a, a couple more. Um, let's see, whoops. Alan, who just asked about the email address, I'm going to give his comment. Everybody can read it, but he says, my brother lives in Lake Villa. When I first visited his property in 1999, a property that borders a small wetland, four state endangered species could be found there. Black tern, common moorhen, yellow-headed blackbirds, and black crown night heron. <laughs> Today, I don't think any more are being seen there anymore. Okay. Um, Matt yeah, asked, makes sense. there's similar black tern research ongoing in their winter range. Interesting question. Um, uh, yeah, I would say no. Um, it's, um, very difficult to study black terns on their winter range and, um, you know, it'd be an They're area the that, ocean. yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a really interesting idea and I would love to, you know, meet more people that are interested in black terns studying them in South and Central America, but it, they're, they're definitely more difficult to study since they spend so much time over the ocean. Understood. Okay, I think those are the questions in the chat. I think, Sunny, if you want to unmute everybody, um, thank you very much, Stephanie. And I hope that for those of you who've never seen black terns, <laughs> you'll get to see them because they are really spectacular birds. And you can check your check eBird um, to find out where they're being seen in May and June. Um, and Stephanie, you said Chain of Lakes, and where else did you not mention in? Um, there's a Elizabeth Lake in McHenry County. Apparently, they can see, be seen there as well. But it it sounds like that that's right on the state border, so they're mostly in Wisconsin. But it's kind of a shared park that goes across the border. Ten years ago, they also used to be at Glacial Park in which is also McHenry County, mm -hmm. and I would say about eight eight or 10 years ago, they disappeared. Or yeah. I have, I mean, it's not that I'm up there a lot, but we would go there hoping to see them. But you sometimes can see gallinules and y'all had the blackbirds there. Oh, very cool. Yes, well, and we do have a May trip there uh, on weekday trip. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining you. us. And Stephanie, thank you very much for presenting and for studying these fabulous, gorgeous, elegant, wonderful birds. Thank you. Thank you.